Hi, this is the Combined Science Trilogy Higher Paper and it's the Biology Paper 2 right, for 2022. Question number one. This question is about the cycling of water and carbon, so water and carbon in an ecosystem. Which reaction produce water? Right, so aerobic respiration. So I'm taking in oxygen, I'm using up glucose, and I make CO2 plus H2O. Okay, interesting. Anaerobic respiration, what I'm using is I'm using up glucose. I haven't got very much oxygen, right? So what I'm then doing is I'm making lactic acid plus CO2. Photosynthesis is then the opposite of aerobic respiration. So that is then CO2 plus H2O goes to oxygen and I'm making glucose. So back to the question, which reaction produces water? We have got water. <clears throat> right. Uh, no question on this one here. The water cycle provides water for plants and animals on land before the water goes into lakes and seas. Figure one represents the water cycle. Now it's quite difficult, the water cycle, you can get all sorts and hundreds and hundreds of different diagrams from it. But what you've got to do is mostly you've got to know the names on the arrows. Okay, so you've got to know the names on the arrows. Now, what I suspect the next question is going to be is it's going to be label one, two, three, four, five. And there we have it. Okay, so name the processes one to five, five marks for this. Right, so what you've got to do is you've got to learn the water cycle. You know all the words. Right, then this is easy five marks. So number one is evaporation. So evaporation. So that's evaporation. So that's where it's going from a lake up into the atmosphere. Number two, it then condensation, right? So that is then when it goes from being sort of gas vapor in the clouds, in the sky, to where it then becomes uh, clouds. Number three is then when it's raining. Now, obviously, you can't put raining. You've got to put precipitation. Okay, that's then the posh name for raining. Then what it does, it kind of goes through the soil and down little streams and things like that, right, and gets down to back to the lake. That is then called drainage. Okay, so that is then number four where it goes back into the lake. We've then got number five, right, which is slightly different, right, is, we'll do that in dark green, where we're going from a tree to vapour in the sky. Okay, uh, now what you've got to do is you've got to think about your proper biology, right, and we've got leaves going into vapour into the sky. How does water get out of a plant into the sky? It is transpiration, right, and then just remember, right, that that is the xylem, that is doing that, specialised because they're dead. <clears throat> the other word that could have then come up would be translocation, which is the movement of glucose in the phloem. Question number 1.3. Okay. In 2007, the population of the world was 6,000 million, which is 6 billion. A study found that 4.5% of the population had severe water shortage. How many people calculate? Calculate means I'm going to be doing a sum. Calculate how many people had severe water shortage. Shortage. Give the answer in standard form. All right. So let's go for it. So question number three. So what I'm going to do is I've got to write six zero zero zero. I'm going to put little commas in between because that helps me. Zero 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 zero. zero. That's the number of people. And what I want is, I want 4.5% of that. So I'm going to do times by 4.5 divided by 100, which then gives me my percentage, uh, 4.5. Sometimes what I might do on that is because I know I might go 0.0545. I might just multiply it by that because I've then divided it. Okay, but either way you do it. So my answer for that is then 270... O, 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 O. That's what it says in my calculator. Okay. Um, now, 
I've got my answer there. And what I could do is I could write it in there and I'll get two marks. But what I've got to do is I've got to convert it to standard form. Now, standard form is where you've got the number at the start, then a decimal, and then the rest of the numbers following on from it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of work this out in my head. Okay, so I'm going to do it in blue. So I'm going to say the decimal point is there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I've moved it 8 times. So it's 2.7 times 10 to the 8. So my answer there will be 2.7 times 10 to the 8. Now my biggest tip with this ever is work out how to do standard form on your calculator. Right, there will be a button somewhere that converts between big long numbers like that and standard form. And you need to know what it is, because how easy would that be otherwise? 1.4. Why do more people have severe water shortage now than in 2007? Right, so what we've got to do there is we've got to think 16 years ago. Right, let's just go through them. Climate change has increased in the area of deserts. Deserts have got bigger? Yes. Each person drinks less water? No. More water is used to grow crops? Yes. Sea levels have risen because the ice caps are melting, right? That may well have happened, right? But what's that got to do with water shortage? Nothing. Some countries have built desalting factories for seawater. What's that got to do with more? Nothing. Okay. Right, so now what we're doing is we're looking at the carbon cycle. Now, what I've done is here, I've chucked in a sort of diagram of the carbon cycle. Okay, obviously it's not part of the exam paper, but I think it'd end up being quite useful. So leaves on, tree, on a tree contain carbon compounds. Okay, in autumn, the leaves fall to the ground. So we've got our tree. There's the ground, leaves fall to the ground. Microorganisms in the soil recycle carbon, right? So the leaves fall to the ground, right? And microorganisms then recycle the carbon from the leaves so that the carbon is used for new plant growth, right? So what we're here now is we're now talking about microorganisms do something with the leaves so that then plants can then use it. So now if we think about it here, right, so new plant growth. Plants don't take carbon dioxide in from the roots. They take it in through their leaves as CO2, right, for the process of photosynthesis, right? So we need to be kind of linking in that. So it's how do microorganisms do stuff with leaves to make carbon dioxide for new plant growth, okay? It's quite a tricky question to actually come out with. So if I now look at my, my diagram here, right, We've got leaves, I'll just change the colour of that, let's have blue, no, let's have black, nice black, right? We've got decay. Leaves fall off the tree, and what they do is decay, all right? So leaves, when they fall off, decay. And that is the microorganisms, oh my God, I'm going to put it on. That is the microorganisms that are then doing it. They then will follow the cycle around, okay, and also what will happen is the actual stuff, the dead organisms and waste products, which is from the leaves, will then do root respiration. So we've then got respiration of microorganisms releasing CO2. Right, so what we've got, the leaves have fallen off, they decay, which is because of the microorganisms, which is the part that we're talking about. Those microorganisms do respiration, releasing carbon dioxide. And then what is the point in that? The CO2, and this is then linking this bit here, the new plant growth, CO2 is used for photosynthesis. Now, I think that's quite a tricky question, actually. And for four marks, um, what you've got to do is you've got to remember right, the carbon cycle. 1.6. What is one benefit 
of fallen leaves for living plants. What is one benefit of fallen leaves for living plants? Okay, so let's go then. Energy is released for living plants. Well, no, energy isn't released. Insect pests in the soil are killed. No, just leaves falling on the floor. Nitrates are released into the soil. Okay, now I know nitrates are useful. Nitrates are fertilizers, right? So I suspect that one then is the true. Let's just go to the last one just to check. Oxygen is supplied to root cells. What's that got to do with leaves falling on the floor? <coughs> so that question there is a bit of a process of elimination, really. Right? I do know that nitrates right, is all to do with fertilizers, and nitrates do come from fallen leaves. Oh, big, big paragraph. Right? So question number two. Water pollution is a problem for humans and wildlife. True. Explain how human activities are polluting rivers, lakes, and seas. Now, rivers, lakes, and seas. So we're talking about water. So how are humans polluting water? Six mark question. Explain. So what I've done here is I've put the mark scheme in. So uh, another one is simply stated, right? The relevance is not clear. No attempt at logical thinking. Level two, relevant points are identified and there are attempts at logical thinking. Number three, which is then you marked five to six, relevant points are identified, given in detail and logically linked. Right, so what we've got to do here is we've got to think about the reasons why and logically link them to the polluting of rivers, lakes and seas. Right, so what I'm going to do firstly is I'm going to think of all the ways in which humans are polluting water. Sewage. Fertilizers. Herbicides. Toxic chemicals. Waste like litter plastics, stuff like that. So what I've done there is in five. Now, because this is a six mark question, right, probably only need to do three, right? It's never going to do any harm adding extras if you kind of got a pretty good idea that they're right. So explain how human activities are polluting rivers, lakes, and seas. So sewage, what that does is if you've got sewage going into rivers, lakes, and seas, algae grows, and that starts the process of eutrophication. Because what it's doing, it's feeding the algae. Fertilizers, exactly the same thing. It is eutrophication. Okay, now it's not asking you what eutrophication is in this. So what you just gotta do is you then gotta just add it in. Herbicides, right? What will happen if you put loads of herbicides from human activity, it'll just kill all plants and also what it does is it builds up in um, food chain number buff th number four toxic chemicals okay what they can do is literally they can kill outright or again build up Waste, right, which is then polluting things, right? So what we could have is we could have plastics eaten. We could have um, caught in a net. Not biodegradable. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the question again. Explain how human activities are polluting rivers, lakes and seas. So what I've done there is I've done five things. You could probably only just do three. All right, then the question is that explain how human activities are polluting, right? The consequence of all this happening is rivers, God, I can't write at all, rivers, lakes, and seas could 
eventually die. Living organisms, living organisms don't live in those water areas anymore. Now that last bit was a bit waffly really, All right, but the point of the matter is I've gone through different ways in which um, human activities pollute and then what I've done at the end is I've then told the reason why or what actually happens to those places once they are polluted. Question number three. Okay. Uh, on a school field. You know what I'm thinking already? I'm thinking quadrats and I'm thinking transects. Okay, immediately. One area of the soil is usually wet. Well, we never talked about that in lessons before, right? So usually wet and another area of the soil is usually dry, right? So what they're doing is they're just trying to chuck something else in here, right? That just kind of makes you think a little bit more. Students investigated the effect of water in the soil on the number of buttercups. Okay, where we are, quadrats, transects, okay, growing in an area. Water is abiotic, right? Abiotic means it is non-living. Name one biotic factor that may affect the number of buttercups growing on the field. Okay, so we could have competition. We could have herbivores. We could have trampling. We could have, uh, well, all those three things kind of work. So one biotic factor, which may affect the number of buttercups growing in the field. We could have minerals in the soil. Okay, we could have lack of CO2. Okay, there's a number of different things that you can then end up having. Right, and biological is non-living. Here we go. This is it. This is predicted, right, to describe a method to investigate if the amount of water in the soil affects the number of buttercups on the field. Okay, so amount of water in the soil, right, so that is then obviously one of our variables affects the number of buttercups in the field. So let's immediately do a plan, right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a method, okay, which covers the first part. Then we need to talk about the variables. Okay, and then we need to talk about what to do with data. Okay, so what you're doing then is you're kind of covering the whole thing. Describe a method, affect the number of buttercups in a field, right? So what you're doing is you're doing a method, but then you've got to talk about how it is affected by the amount of water. Right, so there's two ways you can do this. And I mentioned it before, I mentioned quadrats and I mentioned transects. Okay, so quadrat is your little kind of square thing. Transect is where you've got a tree, right? And then you've got a line that then goes underneath it. Okay, like a string line. So number one is you split your field up into a grid. Okay, and often it would just be like that. You lines across it, lines across it. And you might name that one, two, three, or A, B, C. And then what you do then is you place the quadrat randomly using the grid plus random numbers right you can't just say oh I'll just throw it on the field right because then that's just biased and it's not scientifically correct you then need to count in at least five places in each of those places you need to do the moisture level okay so that's the first time i've actually referred back to the amount of water in the soil okay the moisture level then you do a mean for each area for each water area so a mean for those ones in dry and a mean for those ones in um wet um, and then what you've then got is you've then got your results table what could you do with the data? You've done a mean, you could then almost do like, you could even do a bar chart, like nice easy bar chart. That's wet, that's dry. Method number two. Method number two is then using your transect. 
And what you could do is you could then make sure that your transect then goes through wet and dry areas. And once you've placed your transect, so that is then the starting point, you lay your transect out, that is your end point, and then what you do is then you do your quadrats at even spaces all the way along. Okay, so quadrat on transect, count the daisies, or daisies or buttercups, is it? Buttercups. Okay, so once you've then counted the buttercups in each individual area, you need to do the moisture in each area. Do it in at least five places. Repeat. And then do a mean. Right, and then for both of these, right, what you've then got to do is then you've got to say what your conclusion is going to be. You need to then chuck in a conclusion. Because your conclusion is telling me what you are then going to find out. Now, you haven't got any data to say what you've actually found out. But what you can do is you can then write down, in the moist areas, I found this. And in the dry areas, I then found that. Okay, question number four. Right. Scientists investigated. Uh-oh, this sounds like a required practical coming up. The effect of soil nitrate ion concentration on the yield of corn. Okay, I've never done anything about soil nitrate concentration, but let's go along with it. This is the method, right? So they're telling you a method. Corn plants were grown in a large box of soil. There we go. The soil nitrate ion concentration in this box was kept at zero. So that means there is no nitrate ion, zero nitrate. And that PPM, parts per million. All the corn from each plant in the box was removed and weighed. Okay, the mean mass of corn per plant was calculated. So what they got is they got a corn plant. There's a corn plant. It's got corn growing out of it. Well, that just looks really weird. God, I should never have done that. I didn't get enough racket. Okay. So all the corn from each plant in the box was removed and weighed. And I assume that's kind of after a set amount of time. The mean mass of the corn per plant was calculated. Steps one to four were repeated for boxes containing soil with different concentrations. All ah, right, so what they're doing here is they're saying they started with naught, and what they're going to do is they're going to do it extra amounts of nitrate to compare the nitrate. So I'm thinking now is don't mess in class. So dependent is what I'm going to measure during it right and that is then it's going to be the mean mass of corn and my independent variable what i'm going to change between each one is my ppm of nitrates now i have no idea whether they're going to ask me any of that right but what i'm doing here is i'm now thinking about the question itself give two variables the scientists should have controlled right so we've got don't mess in class stay calm right so what they're doing is they're asking for a control variable right so what we could have is we could have light intensity we could have the amount of water we could have the temperature we could have the ph of the soil we could have the type of the soil. Okay, and we could also have, make sure that the type of plant stays the same. So what I've done then is the two variables, I've then done one, two, three, four, five, six different things. And obviously you only need to write down two. Graph, cool. All right, 4.2, complete figure three. There's figure three. So what they want me to do, they want me to draw a graph. Here are my things that I am then going to be plotting. But you know what? They do not make these things easy, right? What they've actually done is they've said four marks and they've given me four bullet points of what I should do. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start at the top one. Label the y-axis. That's the y-axis. I've got soil nitrate ion concentration at the bottom. So therefore, I'm going to write out in full mean mass of corn per plant in grams okay t 
tick. Just got a mark. How easy was that? Use a suitable scale for the y-axis. Right, so the y-axis, it goes up to 268, so let's call it 300. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go 50, there, that will work, won't it? 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. Okay, now I don't need to go any further than that. Now there is a bit of space at the top, so I could maybe have done it 40, 80, 120, right? But that one works. Use a suitable scale. Tick. How easy is this? I've got two marks already. I know I've got them. Plot the table data from table one and draw a line of best fit. Now I'm going to struggle a little bit here on this kind of graph here, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go north up to 122, all right? Uh, it's going to be about there. Right now, I am going to struggle because it's so small. 10 up to 190, which is going to be about there. Now, when I'm saying about, you have to do it absolutely accurately. 20 up to 256. Okay, so 256 is probably going to be about there. Uh, 30 up to 268. So 250, 260 is going to be about there. 40 up to 240, which is going to probably be about there. And 50 up to 184, 150, 60, 70, 84. Okay, plotted it. Now, if you don't plot it accurately, like absolutely bob on accurately, right, what they'll do is they'll just mark it wrong, right? So don't be silly, take your time. Draw a line of best fit. Okay, now I stand back and I look at that graph there and I think, what shape is it? And that is pretty obviously, right, kind of like an upside down U. So my line of best fit, right, has to be one line, right? It's got to go through as many dots as it possibly can. Do you like the noises there? All right, that is then my line of best fit. And again, I can't physically do it brilliantly perfect, okay, because of the nature of the way that I'm actually writing this. You know what? I've just got four marks on there. I'm pretty confident about that. 4.3, okay, describe the relationship between soil nitrate iron concentration and the mean mass of the corn plant. So now what they want to do is they want to actually, using the table, they actually want me to come up, kind of say what's happening just from the numbers. Okay, so... Um, as the soil nitrate iron concentration in PPM increases, so does the mean mass of corn plant in grams until 30 ppm then it decreases okay now what you've done there is i know it's stupid right but i've just written them in okay so that shows then what you're looking at that's one observation the one thing i could do and then the second one is so that's number one that's number two i could then say the maximum um mean mass in grams is 268 at 30 ppm okay so all i've done is i've just looked at the table 4.4 Farmers add nitrate fertilizer to fields where they grow corn. Okay, uh, I can feel eutrophication coming on. Okay, coming up a fair bit this time, whether they're going to talk about it or not. Nitrate fertilizers are expensive. Okay, right, let's forget about eutrophication. And what we're going to do, can I actually get rid of that? What I'm going to do is I am then going to talk about expensive. Right. As soon as they start talking about expensive, the whole question then is going to be about money. Evaluate the economic, economic and environmental implications 
environmental implications. All right, of adding fertilizer to soil in nitrate iron concentrations ranging from 0 to 50. Right, so economic, let's think about money. As I increase the nitrate to 30 ppm, there will be an increase in yield. Okay, so that's kind of one point. If I increase the nitrate to 30 ppm, there will be an increase in yield. All right. Uh, point number two. If I go greater than 30, there will be a decrease in yield, which means loss of money. All right. So what you've got to do on this is you've got to think about a balance. It is a balance of increase the ppm to get optimum yield based on cost of nitrate and yield right so i don't know whether i've actually written that down particularly very well all right but what it's really saying there is right if i add 10 ppm of nitrate right and it costs me 100 quid and my yield gives me an extra 200 quid that's great if i go up to 30 ppm and it costs me a thousand pounds but my yield only goes up by 900 quid then that's not good now if i go back to the question evaluate the economic and the environmental okay now environmental implications are the fact of this will be then your eutrophication if you start adding nitrates to soil and that gets washed off because of the rain there may well then be an issue with it and it will go into rivers look at what eutrophication is now there's one thing that then has just sprung to mind then okay with the first part of it is what is the original soil ppm right so think about that then right what is the original soil ppm so marks for this from an economic point of view if you increase the nitrate to 30 there will be increase in yield right so that's obviously good you're going to get more money greater than 30 you're going to lose number three is it's kind of a combination of everything then what you got to do is you've got to balance the increase of ppm to get the optimum yield based on the cost of nitrate and the yield produced right but then you also need to kind of consider a little bit what was the original ppm of the soil itself it was if it was 30 you don't need to add any more fertilizer then the environmental implications because it does say environmental eco economic and environmental you then need to talk about what environmental problems it could be now, in the uh, mark scheme, it says you can get three marks just for the economic. If you don't mention anything to the environmental, you will be capped. Even if you do 5,000 different answers on the economic, you will be capped at three. Right? So make sure you're reading the question. Question number five. Okay. Now, I read that first part of the question there. Right? And it says blood glucose. As soon as it says blood glucose, I'm thinking insulin, I'm thinking glucagon, I'm thinking glycogen, and I'm thinking glucose. Okay, right. So blood glucose concentration in the human body needs to be kept within normal range. Homeostasis. Homeostasis. Figure four shows that two hormones control blood glucose concentration. So if it's low, it goes to the pancreas and you get hormone A, which takes it back to normal. And if it's high, the pancreas produces hormone B and it takes it back to normal. 
all right? Name the type of hormone controlled. That is negative feedback. So if there's a problem, what happens is the negative feedback makes the body solve the problem. All right, so uh, looking at the diagram now, name hormones A and B in figure four. All right, so A, let's have a look at that. So A is where the insulin or the sugar is low. So I remember from the lessons itself that that is then glucagon. And then when the sugar is high, the pancreas releases insulin to then get it back to normal again. 5.3. Like another six marker, right? 5.3. Explain how the two hormones in figure four keep the blood glucose concentration within normal range for three hours after the meal. All right, now there's obviously uh, three hours after a meal. So what we've got is we've got meal and then we've got three hours later. So let's think about it. When you got the meal, what's going to happen is glucose is going to go up. Then after a little bit of time, the body is then going to get it to normal. But what you're then going to do is during that time is you're going to need energy down to three hours. Right. So what kind of hormones and things like that are then going to be involved right away from it? Right. So you eat a meal and what happens is glucose increases All right so you eat a meal the glucose increases so what you then got to do is your pancreas produces insulin and what the insulin does is the insulin makes glucose enter cells reducing blood glucose levels okay now what actually happens to that glucose when it goes into the cells what it is it is converted into glycogen usually in the liver All right it can be muscles all right so what I've done then is I've dealt with that top bit there Right, because what you've got to do is you've got to rate, say, after three hours. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to make you think that all you've got to do is you've got to say what insulin does. Now, we've got the second point now is you then need energy. So then, as you're then functioning, right, as you do walk around, as you move, your glucose goes down. Right? And when your glucose goes down, then what you've got to do is then you've got to produce glycogen. Uh, sorry, not glycogen, flipping it, what am I talking about? Glucagon, which then converts glycogen into glucose. Then your glucose increases to normal. All right. Now, what you can do is you can see what the question is actually trying to catch you out with. All right. Keep the blood glucose within the normal range. All right. So you've had a meal. Keep it in the normal range. So what you then do is then you've got your insulin. But the little crafty bit that then they add on to the end there, all right, is for three hours after the meal. So what they're after is they have to double the amount. So if you just do insulin perfectly, you'll get three marks. If you don't talk about the three hours afterwards, you miss out on the extra three marks. That's a bit devious. Question number four. Female reproductive hormones are used to treat infertility in women. Right, let's go for LH, FSH, estrogen, and progesterone. All right, now what I do is I know that they are the four kind of female hormones that we're ever going to talk about. So female reproduction, reproductive hormones are used to treat infertility in women, right? Infertility. FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and then luteinizing hormone can be injected into a woman to help her become pregnant by sexual intercourse. Check it out. Sexual intercourse, right? So there isn't IVF involved here. 
its sexual intercourse. Explain how injecting FSH and then LH will help a woman to become pregnant. Okay, right, three marks. So what we're going to do first is we're going to do FSH causes follicles to become mature. Okay, that's my mark number one, I'm sure. All right, so injecting FSH. Number two, uh, LH causes ovulation, okay, which is then the release of the egg. Okay, so what I've done then is I've then done LH to help a woman get pregnant. Now this is then, see how they've sneaked in sexual intercourse, all right? What we do then is number three, that means there will be more chance of pregnancy because there will, God, I can't write, will be more eggs. Because the chances are, if you're injected with FSH, you're going to produce more than one egg. Five point five. Okay, four marks again. In some women, the injections of FSH and LH are the first steps of IVF. So now they're talking about IVF as well. So we had sexual intercourse, right? Where then then producing more eggs, and then sexual intercourse will then allow more eggs the chance to get fertilized. Now they're talking about describe the remaining steps of IVF. Okay, so first part is. Eggs don't ovulate, right? So what they're doing there is you don't give them the LH, which is the ovulation one. So the LH isn't given. So not give LH because you don't want to ovulate. The follicles, the mature follicles are collected, right? Using a nice needle. Then they are fertilized in a lab okay hence the IVF in vitro means in glass fertilized in a lab they then develop into an embryo and then they are inserted back into the uterus okay so that's IVF 5.6. There are two different processes of cell division in humans. All right, two different processes of cell division in humans. Describe three differences between cell division to form sperm cells compared with cell division to form liver cells. Right. I reckon we're talking about mitosis and meiosis. Now, just for information, if you are asked to write the word meiosis down, that is one of those ones that must be spelt correctly. Okay, so make sure you are. So mitosis for they become X's, they line up, and then they split. Okay, so that's meiosis, mitosis, sorry. And what I've done is I've gone from the parent and I've then got two identical daughter cells. Meiosis, I might have to do this one a little bit smaller. Same starting point. Cross, 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 cross. That's too big, too small. Then what they do is instead of lining up in a line like that one, they line up in pairs. Then they separate. Oh my word, I'm never going to fit this in. X, big X, little X, big X, little X. Let's make that one a bit bigger. Big X, little oh, that doesn't even look like X's. Then they then line up X, X. They then line up X, X. Then they split. Then they split. And then we've got one, 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 one. Okay, meiosis, it's a bit more complicated. Well, I, mean, I haven't even answered the question yet. Describe three differences between cell division to form sperms, that's meiosis, 
compared with cell division to form liver cells. All right, so let's start it off. Meiosis there forms sperms. So what you're doing is you're saying the actual name of the process. Mitosis forms liver cells. Cool. Next difference. You've got one division to make that one, and you've got two for that one. So sperms need two divisions. Liver cells need one division. And then number three at the end, we've got sperms or meiosis is four non-identical daughters. And in liver, we've got two identical daughters. And you could also add in there that the difference between them is that sperm has 23 chromosomes and the liver cell has 46 chromosomes. Quite good. Question number six. Right now, I have to admit, I really kind of don't like this question at all. Uh, the polar bear is a mammal that lives in Arctic habitats. Complete table two for the classification of the polar bear, Ursus maritimus. All right. Uh, and what you've got to do is you've got to fill in these blanks. Now, I always remember it as King Philip can order five giant sausages. Now, there are other ways of actually remembering that. Right, so the classification group for Philip is phylum. I think that's only got one L in it, apologies. Um, can order five is then family. Okay, and then the kingdom is animalia. And the top one is then eukaryote. Now, I don't like that question, right, because... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's just one of those things I just don't like. Question number six, graphs. Now, graphs are different. I like graphs. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the graph. Scientists have been measuring the area of sea ice in the Arctic since 1980. There we go, 1980, and it goes up to 2020. Figure five shows the area covered by sea ice every September. Okay, well, there's dots all over the place. There is a general pattern. Right, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at that one there. Are they going to ask about that? Are they going to ask about that? Are they going to ask about that? All right, are they going to ask about that one? Right, sort of anomaly ones. Uh, but generally, as the year goes on, the amount of sea ice decreases. Right, let's see what they're going to ask. Right, so what we've got here then. Determine the annual rate of loss of sea ice between 1985 and... Uh, and 2017, right, which is about there, all right? Now, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to draw myself a triangle. Now, it's from theirs. Now, obviously, because my graph is so small on here, I would normally use a ruler, right? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from there. I'm going to go across with a perfect straight line. And I'll go down there whoa, with a not perfect straight line. And then what I've got to do is I've got to determine the annual rate, annual, right? And because it's a rate, I know that it's going to be time or some sort of time on the bottom, because that always is, between 1985 and 2017. Now, what I've done is, uh, using the big graph, I've then worked it out, right? So this side over here is 7.75 take away 4.32 equals 3.43, which is the square kilometers, or millions of square kilometers. Okay, I can't write that very well. Okay, square kilometers, that's terribly written. 
all right so that is then that side there is 3.43 then I've got to do the difference in the years so the years is 32 years and then I've got to do my sum which is 4.32 divided by 32 equals um, 0.1071875 right now it doesn't tell me how many uh, significant figures it is so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it to two decimal places two decimal places which is basically the same as two sig figs so rate of loss million squares per year is 0.12 million square kilometers per year okay oh lots of writing lots of writing green english is on now okay so the total number of polar bears living in the arctic ice is not known okay fair enough the hunting of polar bears has been banned okay so hunting banned naughty naughty in some populations the average mass and polar bears has decreased so bears getting smaller polar bears eat seals seals live on the sea ice in winter and raise their pups there in early spring right so seals live on the sea ice in winter and raise their pups there in early spring in the summer seals live mainly in the sea so in the summer seals in the sea okay so what that does that sounds a bit like the fact that polar bears aren't going to be able to catch them very easily polar bears spend much of the year hunting seals on the sea ice and in the sea nearby the sea ice area is at its lowest each year in september at the end of summer and at the end of summer the polar bears feed mainly in early spring and again in autumn to build fat stores to survive the next winter all right i guess that is then when they're going to be hibernating during the winter of 2017 scientists measured the metabolic rate of nine female polar bears and found them to be much higher so metabolic rate increased interesting cameras attached to the female polar bears showed they had to swim long distances to reach seals so they couldn't find the seals so just why polar bears find it harder to catch seals in autumn than in spring right so what we're going to do is we're going to go winter um, so we're going to go winter then we're going to go spring then we're going to go summer and then we're going to go autumn why polar bears find it harder to catch seals in autumn rather than spring right that's because it tells us there all the sea ice has gone so in autumn autumn there are fewer seals on the ice they are in the sea because there's no sea ice Also, in the autumn, are now adults. Right. So what they've done is they've done the breeding season, and the seals are then much bigger. Right. And then because there is less sea ice, there's going to be more competition between bears. Okay. So that's why it's going to be harder because. Uh, in autumn we've already gone through winter they're hibernating spring they're coming out right and they're probably eating a lot then because there's plenty of sea ice in the summer it starts to decrease in autumn almost all the sea ice is gone or lots of it is gone so therefore all the seals are in the sea and they're obviously going to be a lot harder to catch in the sea sea also seals are then adults they've grown up they're not those white fluffy things that you see anymore right they're proper seals that are going to be harder to catch and therefore there's also going to be more competition so now what we've got is got an evaluate question, which is kind of come up with opinions and discuss and think about it. What might happen to the population of polar bears in the Arctic in the future? Now, the thing with this is, it isn't just to go, well, they'll decrease. 
right? What you've got to do is you've got to think about the options. So they could decrease, but they could also increase. And what you've got to do is you've got to think about that passage that we had before, right? Pick out different bits of information in that, right? So why could the polar bears decrease? Global warming decreases sea ice. Okay, so if there's less ice, then there's going to be less seals for them to catch. Uh, so therefore, there is less seals because what they're doing is they're swimming further out. They're further away. There's also that part said that the females are smaller so if they become smaller they will be less able to catch prey okay because they need to be big the population could increase because hunting laws have changed so that means if we're not as stupid humans if we're not hunting polar bears then the numbers may well increase Humans again sort out climate change. Polar bears could also change their hunting habits. Right, so what I mean by that is rather than hunting seals, they might start hunting other things like bins and things like that, right, in in local human populations. So they could then choose or change the way that they actually hunt. Now, that's then the full paper. And what you've got to do is, it's not the facts that are the most important thing in it. It is understand, well, understand how questions are answered. Okay, that is by far and away the most important thing right by doing a past paper like that.